Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Martin Wolf, who is an associate editor and chief economics commentator for the Financial Times. His most recent book is Fixing Global Finance. Martin, welcome to Berkeley. Pleasure to be here. Where were you born and raised? I was born in London. I, I was raised in London and I went to, uh, I think you'd call, say college or university at Oxford. And looking back, how do you think your parents and their experiences shaped your thinking about the world? Well, both my parents were refugees from Hitler. My father came from Austria, from Vienna, and he left in 1937, which is just about a year before the, the Germans, the Nazi armies, invaded Austria. Uh, my mother was from Holland, and she, with her family, managed to escape just as the Germans were invading the Netherlands. So. Uh, they were both refugees. They both lost a very large proportion of their family in the Holocaust. And I've always been aware, I think, as a result, as the children of these refugees living in a very nucle small nuclear family in England, of the fragility of civilization and the, the danger of breakdown leading to extremism, in this case, of course, fascism, and the terrible consequences thereof. And I think that's in a way informed most of my ideas, my thinking, my emotional responses to events ever since. Mm -hmm. and, and what did you major in, in uh, college and university? And did it follow from this, uh, uh, these uh, recollections of your Well, family? I have a slightly strange intellectual history, at least for contemporary, uh, for the contemporary world. Like many uh, young English uh, children who are relatively bright, I, I did classics, uh, classical languages, uh, both at high, the last few years of what you'd call high school and then for the first two years or almost two years at university. Uh, uh, so I spent a lot of time, five years of my life, basically just reading Latin and Greek. Uh, then uh, I was always very interested in politics. This was the 60s, which was... Uh, uh, it seems a long time ago, it was a very political decade, of course, mm -hmm. in Europe as well, of course, here, um, very famously so in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was interested in politics and I decided that one really couldn't understand politics and political issues. Remember, this was the time of the great conflict with communism, the Cold War, which was very much about economics as well as about uh, foreign policy. I, I thought we just couldn't understand that without trying to understand economics. So I decided I would switch to what in Oxford is called politics, philosophy and economics, a very famous degree invented at the beginning of the 20th century. So I, I then did politics, philosophy and economics with a concentration in economics. And I got really quite interested in economics. I thought this was really interesting and important stuff. Without it, you really couldn't make sense of the world. So then I did a graduate degree in economics also at Oxford. Uh, what we call the, it was then the BPhil, the Bachelor of Philosophy, now it's the Master of Philosophy, which in a way is the, the master's part of a doctorate. I didn't do a PhD because I never wanted to be an academic. Mm -hmm. and, but, but you have a position in a university, and so the, I wanted to ask you about the synergism between the academy and journalism, although your primary vocation is as a journalist for the Financial Times. Well, I've been, first of all, to, ex to make clear, I only became a journalist in in my early 40s, which is very exceptional. Hmm. I started my life out as a professional economist, but very much applied. I, in fact, spent the first 10 years of my life working for the World Bank under Robert McNamara in the 70s. That was an era when people really believed in development and development economics. It was a time of great hope in this regard. And very much of what I've learned about the world and particularly about developing countries, very much hmm. in this book and in, my, and in my previous book on globalization was at that time. I got into uh, journalism by accident. Essentially, I knew the then editor of the Financial Times, a very distinguished and wonderful man called Jeffrey Owen, uh, who, who in many ways helped create the modern Financial Times. He asked me to be their chief leader writer, as we would call it, as you, I think, think, would call the sort of head of the editorial board, that sort of position. And I thought this sounded incredibly exciting, a great opportunity to contribute to the public debate using economics. So I did that. But I've always continued to do, I suppose, somewhat academic things for a journalist. And my columns are certainly very academic for a journalist. I don't think anything but the Financial Times or The Economist would dream of publishing uh, um, columns with footnotes and complex charts. So I've always had that. Uh, I've, I'm moderately well known for my writing in international trade and international economics. 
And f a friend of mine, who's now vice chancellor of Nottingham, but was then head of the economics department, invited me to have this special professorship. And uh, it just, it's not very arduous. I do a lecture or two a year. I meet the students. I also continue to have a connection with Nuffield College, where I was as a, as a graduate. And I've been lucky enough to have been given three honorary degrees, which I find immensely pleasing and flattering. The, the World Bank uh, experience, how, how, how did that affect you? Did it, is that the source of your uh, interest and concern with international economic institutions, the international economic order? Well, I, I mean several, I think. Uh, first, of course, I went into the World Bank because I was already interested. I had a very able teacher at, at Oxford. At that time, Oxford was very much the center of thinking about development, economics and international economics. People who perhaps not so well known like Ian Little, James Merlees, who later, of course, got the Nobel Prize, was there working on cost-benefit analysis. Uh, my own teacher was a man called Max Corden, who uh, was uh, teach, taught international trade. So I was already interested. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, it is true, by going to the World Bank, because actually I thought development, I still think actually development mm -hmm. was one of the great causes of our lifetimes. So I wanted to do that. I thought it'd be very interesting. But it's true, I learned a great deal about it. First, about the differences between countries that do succeed and don't succeed and the very complicated underpinnings of successful economic growth. I learned a great deal about what trade can do and the, the benefits of the open international economy, but also the problems of managing it. I could see that. I learned a, a lot, particularly because my longest period of work was on India, about the problems with really inward looking, highly state regulated, highly bureaucratic development. And I haven't changed my view that that was immensely costly for India. And of course, China was reaching the same conclusions in different ways at the same time. So I learned a lot about what you shouldn't do, what you should do. I learned basically that the, this was an important cause development, but and it needed to be promoted by an open, sta reasonably stable and supported, supportive international system. Now, I've learned a lot more about financial problems since then because they weren't significant in the 70s. But I think those basic lessons and those basic values have remained with me throughout my professional life. So your book, uh, Fixing Global uh, uh, Finance, really uh, points to uh, uh, the present crisis, even though it was completed uh, before that the, the world economy had been hit by that crisis. What set of problems did, did you discuss and analyze in that book that feel very important uh, for what is going on now? Let me first be absolutely clear, as you rightly said, this book was uh, prepared predominantly before the crisis began. In fact, it originated with a, a big series of lectures at uh, Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies in, in the, the spring of 2006. So it, like many academic ventures, it took a long time to bear to reach fruition. I have to write my books in the summers because I have a job otherwise. So that, it took a while. Uh, the, and I certainly, when I was doing this, did not expect so total a meltdown, that sort of something that's beginning to feel like a depression. It's not what I expected. But the analysis here is, is basically very simple. Um, s over the last 30 years or so, we've been trying to recreate an open global financial system which previously we hadn't really had since the end of the 19th and early 20th centuries. And we were doing so in a very special context, in a world of floating exchange rates, not fixed exchange rates, as had been the case in that prior era under the gold standard, floating exchange rates with uh, um, very volatile finance. And the argument of the book is that we'd had of this period, really starting in the early 80s with the Latin American debt crisis, a long series of enormous uh, foreign exchange and banking crises, predominantly, though not exclusively, in the emerging world. And in many of those crises, which had, which had really devastated the economies concerned, there had been uh, huge drops in output and mass bankruptcy in the financial and non-financial corporate uh, sectors because of so-called currency mismatches. Part of the, the whole problem, I thought, was that these people had borrowed in dollars, predominantly, their, their, their assets, of course, were domestic currency. And in a panic, the currency collapses, falls a long way. So all their liabilities, which are dollars, 
rise in value against their assets and there's bankruptcy throughout the system. The last and worst of these crises was the Asian financial crisis in 1997-98 and that in my view marked a turning point in the policy of the emerging world, uh, uh, policies which in fact China itself then followed. What they then did is really deliberately run policies to minimize their vulnerability to capital inflow. They basically took they had undervalued real exchange rates or undervalued exchange rates or these fixed exchange rates at which they had large export surpluses. They, in addition, received uh, private capital. They recycled the current account surpluses and this inward capital into official foreign exchange reserves, which were relent basically out into the world and predominantly to the US. The numbers involved are absolutely staggering. World foreign currency reserves have risen by $5.5 trillion since the end of the 1990s, predominantly in emerging economies. So there's been some increase in Japan, but it's basically been emerging on. You've got to think about the scale of this from relatively poor countries. So it's a massive capital flow into the, into the rich countries. In addition, because of the savings surpluses that were the counterpart had to be of the current account surpluses, which exploded, there was also a big fall in global real interest rates. And that created this combination, I think, of this flood of liquidity and the fall in real interest rates created the conditions for the housing bubbles we saw not only in the United States and elsewhere. And the final stage of this is what we then saw emerge is what one think of as twin deficits. Um, normally in the US they talk about twin deficits, they mean the fiscal deficit and the current account deficit. Well, the current account deficit was there. It reached absolutely unprecedented proportions in the United States. So we States. were buying, we were a consumer. But you were consuming, you were the consumer of last resort in the system, the borrower of last resort. You were spending more than your income by a large amount. That was the, the external imbalance, as it were. The domestic imbalance in this case was not so much government as households. If you looked at the American situation, it was very similar in Britain and in some other countries. What was striking is that for, to a degree that had never happened before, American households were spending more than their income. They were running so-called financial deficit, spending more than their income, to a degree that had never happened before in the context of this huge housing bubble. So I identified in this book two vulnerabilities. One was the external imbalance, the, the, the accumulation of liabilities by the US, which in fact so far, has not turned out to be a big problem, but it may yet. We can discuss that later. Mm -hmm. And the other imbalance, which turned out in the end to be a very big problem, was this massive rise in house prices and this massive increase in borrowing by the household sector, which was the counterpart of this huge increase in the current account surpluses of the emerging world. So in the end, we had a system which is, I regard as dysfunctional and undesirable, which capital was flowing from poor countries, immense quantities to the world's richest, we weren't doing a very good job of using it. And I think that has been at least a very significant reason for the scale of this crisis. And I, I want to just draw out certain points here. One was in the crisis of the 90s, uh, the emerging countries, which are weak institutionally, which means that they are vulnerable to crises because of mismanagement, because of, of of, uh, of spending too much money and on and on, that, that they learned a lesson from that crisis. Uh, and, and as a result, they said, we're going to insulate ourselves from the world economy by creating these enormous reserves. So I, I, I can't help but asking, was there a failure of leadership by Greenspan, Rubin, and Summers in the 90s in response to uh, uh, the, uh, the, the financial crisis that imprinted doubly so this lesson on the developing countries? I think in retrospect, it's clear that the way the crisis was handled, and I actually discussed that at length in my earlier book on globalization, mm -hmm had exactly the consequences you describe. It deeply imprinted upon uh, the developing world the need to insulate themselves from these financial crises through the accumulation of foreign currency reserves. And I think the present uh, crisis will reinforce that. That's a very big issue. Now, could the authorities of that you describe, the Americans you list, have prevented that brutal lesson? And the answer is yes, they could, but I think only in a very different political context here.
and in the West. Because basically what would have had to have happened, and what I think ought to happen now, actually, is that far more money was made available to these countries to cushion the shock. As it was, they were forced to adjust within a year to a turnaround of capital which was enormous. So m a number of these countries moved from a current account deficit of 8% of GDP or so to a large current account surplus in a year. Now, if you think about that, that's a shift in spending of maybe 10, 12% of GDP in, in one year, much bigger than anything the US is now experiencing. That was a tremendous shock. Now, the only way you could have helped is if much more money could have provi been provided by either through the International Monetary Fund or through other means to cushion this shock, which is actually what you did do with Mexico, because Mexico was your neighbor and you were very concerned about this. Many of these countries, uh, f least I think Korea, but uh, even there, feel that the Americans who were their ally and friend, who had encouraged them to liberalize, and it's absolutely unquestionable, they were encouraged to liberalize their capital accounts throughout the 90s without being warned of the dangers. There's no question we underestimate estimated these dangers, they felt that they'd been abandoned. The Indonesians felt this quite strongly. So uh, in the end, America allowed them to suffer. Now, the American officials whom we've mentioned would all say, we actually did provide quite a lot of help. They did. They, they didn't leave them to do. There was assistance provided. There's no question about it. But, and we provided as much as Congress would allow us to provide as, as you know, we couldn't have written these huge checks to these uh, countries. Congress wouldn't have permitted it. The IMF had very limited resources. So in the end, that was how it was. I, that's not actually quite right because Japan actually proposed the creation of an Asian monetary fund at this time, which would have possibly provided much more assistance. And uh, the, the US in particular strongly and fiercely opposed that idea, which I think was a great mistake. And they fiercely opposed it because they wanted to retain control through the US and the IMF. Whether they could have done better in the political circumstance in the US is, I think, a, an open question. It's still hotly debated among economists, and people like Joe Stiglitz and Jeff Sachs would still be very critical of the handling of this crisis by um, um, the three men you mentioned. But what is certain is whether or not it could have been done better, the lesson most Asians drew and the, including people who are not directly affected by the crisis, but just watching it, like the Chinese, the Indians, and so forth, is that the sensible thing to do was to insulate yourself as far as possible by minimizing the net capital inflow, accumulating massive foreign currency reserves. So ensuring yourself, because the world won't help you, it's an unstable world. The foreign currency regime is fundamentally unstable. And as our capital flows, as we've seen again, and the right thing to do is to ins insulate them. And because these countries are now really big globally, we're talking uh, now uh, about close to half the world economy, they do influence the rest. Uh, you know, uh, the point I try to make to Americans, yes, America's the biggest single economy without a question, but in an open economy, the US is 25% and the rest of the world is 75%. So the rest of the world is bigger than the US. And when the rest of the world all decide to do the same thing, it affects the US in a very big way. And if you don't understand that, you don't really understand what's happening to the US, why this crisis happened. And just on your last point, uh, uh, one of the points you made. I do think the American debate is far too inward looking mm -hmm. and far too unaware of the fact that the US is actually part of the world economy and it's an open economy in that context, mm -hmm. not even that bigger one. And, and I want to just uh, 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 re-emphasize something you're saying for an American audience, which is when this uh, response to the 90s com uh, 1990s financial crisis comes about, you essentially have a lot of money that needs some place to go. And so that becomes the push uh, because the chief uh, absorber of that money becomes the United States. So this is the way our excess consumption is funded. So you can't really understand the current crisis without understanding the push from the emerging countries and the pull from American economic domestic policies. Exactly. The way I put it, it takes two to tango. And I wouldn't, um, in my book, I tend to argue that actually the push was more important than the pull, that the, the pull in a significant measure, certainly in the Federal Reserve's policies, responded to the push. That's certainly what 
Mr. Bernanke th thought when he produced his very f famous speech on the savings glut, which justified what they were doing. But let's say at least there was a push and a pull, and the two together created these massive flows. And at one point, as Kenneth Rogoff of Harvard has pointed out, uh, if you ignore the flows of capital within Europe, which is a special thing, the United States was absorbing about 70% of the world's excess savings. So just a staggering situation. How could you ever have expected, no international economist expected us to be in a situation in which the world's richest country is absorbing 70% of the excess savings of the rest of the world. When I read your book and, and, and as I read about the current uh, uh, crisis, and here I'm also talking about your columns in the Financial Times, which I highly recommend, they're online, uh, for, for understanding what's going on beyond a kind of a narrow American uh, perspective. Uh, I have the sense that we're talking about a series of political failures. The political failure in the emerging countries, uh, the political failure in the United States, as you just discussed, and continuing to the present day, and thirdly, the international political failure to create a transformed IMF after the end of the Cold War, which would do a good job of holding the hand, working with these emerging countries, so the capital would be flowing to those countries so that they could develop and become a source of expenditure for the world. I think that is absolutely right. And of course, the last cannot be independent of the second, because though the Europeans play an enormous part, and I don't want to enter it, underemphasize that. Uh, of course, the U.S. is the biggest single voice in the IMF. I think it's important to remember the ideology of the 90s and the early part of this decade. And I was to some extent part of that, so I'm not exonerating myself. The general idea was capital markets were stable and efficient. Uh, an institution like the IMF creates moral hazard because it encourages people to do dangerous and irresponsible things. So you need to reduce the IMF. And what you need to do is to just let the capital markets do their thing. And if these countries open themselves up to capital markets, in freely, capital will flow where it's most efficient and everything will be fine. And that's what we believed, right? And that's what they were told to believe. And some of them did believe because they, their view was, well, if the Americans tell us this, they understand capitalism, they know how it works, they're very rich and successful, so we should follow their lead. And that was very much the ideology of the time. I think in this respect, the, the Asian financial crisis was the turning point in that thinking for many people in the emerging world, serious policymakers realized, well, whatever the virtues of capital market, free capital markets in the long run might be, they were vulnerable to extreme panics and relatively small countries without a reserve currency of their own were incredibly vulnerable to crisis in the context of such a panic because they would find that they couldn't save their own businesses because they didn't produce the dollar, which was the crucial currency in such a panic, as it is indeed today. And the U.S. is in so much better position to deal with a panic, a crisis, because it issues the key currency. So they change their minds. Now, in the West, and particularly in the U.S., but also in the U.K. and a number of other countries, we didn't change our minds. We continued with the same view on the benign nature of completely liberalized financial flows and a liberalized financial system. And we didn't pay much attention to what they were doing because we believed they knew the system knew what it was doing. Emerging world didn't believe that anymore. Now, we don't either. So that is a really big turning point. But you've got to understand that the failure to deal with the, the international system side to make the international regulation and above all the financing side of the IMF work and to consider all the other issues I deal with in the book um, was a consequence of the ideology of the time. It was tested to destruction in the emerging world, I would say, in the 90s. And they reached their conclusion about this. They had to insulate themselves, which is why China still hasn't liberalized its capital account, why India still hasn't liberalized its capital account. And I don't think it's going to happen very soon now, to, be, to tell you the truth. And on the other hand, we went on happily for another 10 years, and now it's blown up in our faces. Mm -hmm. uh, is this was what you're describing is the age of globalization under President Clinton and 
uh, which, which became, in essence, uh, a substitute in some ways for his foreign policy. But I, I, I do want to quote from your book and point out that the, uh, that the emerging countries decided to smoke but not inhale yes. when, it, when it came to, uh, uh, to reserves. I thought that was a nice uh, sentence. Yeah, and I think it's a, it's a fitting... Uh, a fitting uh, uh, I believe it was his sentence. Yes, know, yes, sentence. that's so. correct. Uh, in in his denial of of having uh, uh, actually inhaled the marijuana when he was in college, and, and I just want to emphasize one other point again that under you say under adjustable rate exchange, the only safe way to borrow is in one's own currency. If this is not possible, borrowing will be limited. And that's an important solution that you see for the future. Yes, I think part of it has to be that. Now, there's a big controversy among uh, well-informed economists about how far emerging economies can move towards uh, uh, being able to borrow freely in their own currencies. And ultimately, of course, we know that no currency is as freely acceptable as the dollar. And as I've already mentioned, that has meant that really uniquely, here is the US, the epicenter of the world crisis. Everybody's panicked, and yet its currency is appreciating. You know, normally, for any other currency, like with the pound today, it depreciates in a crisis. So the US has a privileged position in you know, the, what sometimes what was called famously by a French policy maker, the exorbitant privilege remains. That is crucial. Nonetheless, the point I make is if you think about this problem from the emerging market point of view, and you assume we're not going back to a world of the gold standard and irrevocably fixed exchange rates, there are arguments for such a system, but we're not going to do that in the foreseeable future. Future. Then you have to ask yourself, how can these countries accept net inflows of capital with reasonable safety? Well, if it's foreign direct investment, equity investment, there is, there's less of a problem because it goes down in value when there's a crisis. It's not fixed in any currency terms. But with borrowing, uh, my argument is essentially you can't expose yourself to the risk of huge currency mismatches. And if you're going to borrow a lot in a foreign currency, almost by definition, you will end up with large dollar liabilities. So the solution to that has to be to borrow in your own currency, so to create vibrant and strong domestic currency bond markets, have foreigners buy a sort of diversified portfolio of such uh, of such bonds. In that case, the creditors bear the risk, but the creditors, in my view, are in a much better position to do so because they can diversify their portfolio much more easily than the borrower can, which is just dealing in one currency. And promoting such domestic currency markets, which really did begin in the last few years, would be one way of insulating countries from the crisis. And I think, actually, we've gone a long way towards that. It might help. The problem, unfortunately, is, again, uh, a number of countries have allowed their corporate sectors to borrow a lot in dollars. It seems to have happened in Brazil, and it will create a, a big problem again. Uh, I think our audience now is uh, familiar with the American crisis, probably not with the, 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 the complexity of the causes of that crisis. So let's talk now a little about the crisis and the American response, because then, again, we ru uh, uh, run up against this question of uh, how uh, good were the decisions made by the new triumvirate, uh, uh, Paulson, Bernanke, uh, and uh, uh, Geithner. Uh, and I guess the question I want to ask you was the failure to intervene in behalf of Lehman Brothers. Is that just a symptom, or was it really uh, a major event that could have prevented this crisis of uh, reaching uh, the extreme nature that it has? I think that is an incredibly important question. And there's been uh, a huge debate throughout about what the right way to have handled this, uh, this crisis was. First of all, let's be quite clear, when it broke out in the summer of 2008, the uh, summer of 2007, I apologize. Most people didn't realize how severe it was going to be, and that included all the policymakers. I mean, it's clear that though Mr. Bernanke probably reached this conclusion that it was going to be very serious before anybody else, 
just a month before, in July 2007, he took the view that subprime was probably not going to cost more than about $150 billion, so a relatively small loss. And he was in the Federal Reserve, so he, if he didn't understand it, who would? I mean, outsiders wouldn't. So I think throughout, really, uh, the following 13 months, they were constantly catching up with the severity of the crisis because the truth is they didn't understand what had happened. Nobody understood what would happen. That is one of the most remarkable thing about this. In hindsight, I think it's probably fair to say that um, the piecemeal uh, way of dealing with the crisis, one institution after another, without any plan, was a big mistake. And it allowed the crisis to gather as a panic. Now, on the Lehman case specifically, uh, there are many complicated aspects of this. It is clear that the decision to let Lehman go in the way it was allowed to go was just a collapse with the destruction of uh, all its trading relationships overnight created a unique and unparalleled panic. And this lasted a number of months. It's now, we're now getting through it after pouring immense amounts of money on it. Uh, but it created a unique panic. Uh, basically, the banking system stopped. It just stopped worldwide. And the reason we are in now in such a steep recession around the world, I think, is in large part because of that. So it's clear that it didn't help. But that raises the question, could they have done this uh, in an orderly way, which wouldn't have created such a panic? Yes, they probably could. They could have wound it down. At least in principle, there's a legal question about it. In principle, they could have wound it up in a much more orderly manner, which didn't involve this disruption to all the ongoing trades and all the rest of it that Lehman was involved in. That then gets you to a, a final question is, let's suppose Lehman had never happened. Let's suppose they'd saved Lehman. Um, would the underlying conditions be so vastly different? And here, there, I think, are genuinely different opinions on something which we can't be sure about. One view is that though there was this huge credit explosion, this huge debt explosion, most of it was reasonably sensible. It is something that people could support. And if we avoid the panic, we could have had a, perhaps a very slow adjustment to the U.S. economy as housing, house prices fell, they were going to fall anyway. That's clear. And that was nothing you could do to stop that. And it was clear at some point households in the U.S. would consume less and save more because they were in such an extreme position, same in the U.K. and a number of others. So we would have these corrections, but they will be smooth and slow and manager without the crisis. The other view is that isn't really right. Yes, it's probably accelerated into a short period adjustments which would otherwise have occurred over several years, but these adjustments were going to be very very, very powerful. And that's really, I suppose, my view. The, the underlying point I would make is, yes, this crisis in Lima was very important. It's clearly going to create a lot of secondary damage because of the speed of the adjustment. Everything is being compressed in a few quarters. But the underlying reality was we were on an unsustainable path in the sense that we relied on the willingness of households in a relatively small number of countries to go ever deeper into debt to sustain the balance of global demand. At some point, that would cease. And it did, in fact, already cease before the crisis was over with the collapse of housing house prices here, which is now happening in other countries which had house price bubbles. The correction would happen anyway. And all we've done by this is accelerate it. Now, that's very bad. But it, it's foolish to think that somehow there was some simple trick which would have avoided a pretty long and painful adjustment. And I'm, broadly speaking, in the latter camp. Uh, as with your academic training and your role as a journalist, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm curious about what your sense of ideas uh, emerging uh, is, namely, uh, in the midst of a crisis like this, uh, it's clear that the policymakers are often making it up as they go along. First, they don't understand what it is. Or in the case of Bernanke, he's focused on the depression, which he had studied. But in fact, this isn't an exact uh, replication of that. Uh, what, 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 is, what is your analysis here of the way things change, the way new ideas emerge to deal adequately with the crisis? Because in your columns, you're really critical, I think, of the half-heartedness of the American response. Not enough st stimulus, not enough focus, not enough, I think you've even used the word ferocity uh, in the response. Talk a little about that. 
Well, there are, I mean, this has raised, this crisis has raised so many issues in so many respects. And one of them is the whole future of free market capitalism, what it's going to look like at the end of it, what it should look like. But I've been focusing very deliberately in the last few months on dealing with the crisis. The, uh, my sense is that there, there have emerged sort of three sort of responses to the crisis. One, which is unique to the United States, it doesn't, as far as I can see, exist anywhere else. It's not in power at the moment, uh, but it's still a very important undercurrent of American opinion. I meet it all the time, I read it all the time, is that the right response to this crisis is to do absolutely nothing. Uh, let it burn out, uh, liquidate all the bad institutions, bad I mean, allow what I describe as a mass bankruptcy approach to, to run through the economy. So no stimulus, no exceptional Fed action, uh, allow all the banks to go bust, or allow all the insurance companies to go bust, just allow them to all go bust and, and see what happens. And that's clearly a set, a set of ideas that is very influential in the Republican Party. Uh, it's not in power now, but it's there. Um, it's clearly not going to be tried. Uh, it's not the dominant p for you, but it, it's there. It's a very important uh, set of views. The second, if you like, the extreme opposite view is depressions are unnecessary. Uh, a recession and a correction is necessary. It's going to happen. There's no way we're going to stop that. That's going to happen. But uh, a recession. Yeah, a normal but, recession. But having but something. But not necessarily you know, a depression. Not, now, you will ask me, what's the difference in a recession yeah. <laughs> and a depression? But I, I think the difference is, uh, is cannot be defined exactly. But uh, to my mind, a depression would be occurring if we started uh, experiencing uh, declines of GDP at the rate of 5% a year or so for a couple of years and unemployment went somewhere between 10 and 15% in the US and elsewhere and the recovery were really slow. That's a real possibility I think. You see, the, the, We are in that sort of territory. We're not I think in the sort of territory of recessions we've seen in the post-war period. So that, those are very very damaging events uh, and you have to throw everything you have to prevent them because they create uh, such vast social and economic damage over and above the need, vastly over and above the need to correct the initial uh, excesses which we've already discussed. I'm very much in that, in that camp, perhaps that's because, as I said, I was a child of uh, people who were so damaged by the political events of the 30s. I link the political events of the 30s to the, to the American Depression. That's, I think, where it started. I don't think Hitler would have got to power if German unemployment hadn't been 25%. So I think that's not the sort of world we should want to go to. And I think it will be incredibly damaging in the emerging world where the middle class is emerging. So we want to prevent this from happening. And to do that, you have to, have to act decisively as soon as it's obvious that that is a risk. And it's become obvious that that's a risk in the last few months. And that means you fix the banks as quickly as you possibly can. You throw enough stimulus in the short run to stop the downward spiral, and I don't think the stimulus is enough. And you try to do fix the problems in the international system, which we've been talking about, rebalancing demand so we can get out of it. And you really throw everything at that to prevent us risking just a, to get out, you know, to knock out this sort of tail risk of a uh, of an actual slump. Now, then, in between that, there is the position of reasonable people, as it were, which I I see this administration administration following, which is you've got to do something, but you've got to recognize political reality. You've got, rec got to recognize the difficulty of dealing with the banks, uh, the political power of the banks. You've got to recognize the difficulty of persuading people that they should spend money, that the government can afford it and all the rest of it. And then I fear that that's just going to fall very unsatisfactorily in, in the middle. And, and in, in this, in this uh fight that you're describing within the American debate, uh, one trots out uh, historical examples to, to prove both sides, basically. And, and you just had a column on the case of Japan, which is now said by the right to prove that deficits don't work. They did not uh, uh, get Japan out of the crisis. But, but in a way, facts get distorted, as you point out in your column. Well, it, it depends what you think success is. Uh, I don't think there's any way to get out of a situation of enormous over-indebtedness. I mean, we're talking about, in both cases, absolutely colossal over-indebtedness and huge collapses in asset prices without very substantial damage. I regard the Japanese uh, fiscal policy in the 1990s as having been 
perfectly successful in the very simple sense. They had these huge shocks, uh, you know, wealth losses equal to three times GDP, a, a, an absolutely massive reduction in corporate investment uh, because they'd overinvested so badly. Uh, the shift in the position, financial position of the corporate sector was 20 percentage points of GDP. Uh, despite that, they avoided a slump. In fact, they didn't really have a serious recession. They continued to grow. They've continued to grow until today. Now, the, some of the structural weaknesses of Japan, which are really about demand imbalances in, in Japan, remain. And that they are something that they really do still need to fix. And there are clearly problems in the corporate sector as well. There's no doubt about it. So I wouldn't defend all the, particularly the micro interventions that they've uh, uh, followed. But in terms of the aggregate macro performance, they prevented a depression. And I think that, in the circumstances, was an absolutely remarkable achievement. So the question you have to ask yourself, well, what would have happened if they hadn't done it? If they hadn't done it, it would have been, in my view, immensely much worse. So that's a success. Of course, you can never see that alternative, that counterfactual. So you have to work out on first principles what you think would have happened in that uh, situation. The same applies here. I believe we're now moving in the US to a situation in which the following holds. You've got a large structural current account deficit still, which is a drain on demand, by definition. It's demand coming from the US going to foreigners. Not a bad thing, but it doesn't go domestically. You've got households which are clearly cutting back on their spending and are wanting to save more. You've got a corporate sector that's cut back on its spending and wants to save more. If the government in this situation doesn't go into deficit, you actually try to eliminate the fiscal deficit in this situation, you will, I'm sure, collapse the economy. It will be a much deeper recession than you can imagine now. And incidentally, you won't balance the budget because revenue will go down in the process. It will become very, very difficult in this situation to balance the budget. So I am reasonably confident that in this situation, fiscal action does not crowd out anything. Uh, it will add to demand, uh, particularly if financed by borrowing from the central bank or from, uh, from the banks. And the uh, and the uh, the action of the of the um, of the uh, government will be immensely helpful. What about the problem of the banks? Uh, three weeks ago, a month ago, nationalization would have been a word that uh, would get you locked up in jail in Washington. But in the last couple of days, uh, Lindsey Graham put the N-word on the table. Uh, the other day, uh, Alan Greenspan told your paper that it may uh, be on the agenda. Uh, is that about political? First of all, is nationalization, whatever it's called, an answer here? And is that something that we're going to have to sugarcoat because of the ideology and the atavisms that say you can't do that? Well, the, the movement in the American debate has been staggering, as you rightly observe, and, and almost shocking. I mean, it was unsayable two weeks ago, and everybody's saying it now. Almost everybody is saying it uh, as a possibility now. I, my view has always been that despite the ideological penumbra, Americans are predominantly pragmatic people. And when they're faced with a real crisis, they will deal with it in a fairly pragmatic way, and the ideologues will not get in the way. Why should nationalization be part of the solution? Uh, let's be clear, we're not talking about permanent nationalization. We're talking about uh, um, state uh, um, administration, restructuring, and ultimately uh, returning these institutions or some, some part of these institutions back into the market. Well, first of all, there's experience around the world. There's been well over 100 banking crises, significant banking crises around the world, including actually the Americans' own SNL crisis. And there are sort of fairly standard ways of dealing with them. And one of them is t temporary government ownership, taking out all the bad assets, putting them in a special entity of some kind, like the Resolution Trust Corporation here, which was used in the SNL case. And then you've got a relatively clean institution selling it back to the market. So it has worked. It's part of the standard toolkit for dealing with these crises. And then you have to think, well, what are the alternatives? Assume for a moment that you accept, and of course that's still debated, that a number of very important institutions are in fact if not actually insolvent, quite very severely decapitalized. These then become what was called in the Japanese context zombie banks. An undercapitalized bank is one that can't expand its loan book, 
that uh, it can't start recognizing its losses because if it recognizes its losses, suddenly it emerges that actually its equity is negative. So it, it has to pretend that its loans are good. That often means that it actually has to relend money to failing companies. That's a very severe problem in Japan. Uh, it can't recognize losses on its, uh, on its banking book, on the bad asset it holds. So this becomes a zombie institution. It can't function as a vibrant intermediary. As a long-term proposition, that's very destructive for an economy. And I think it would be particularly destructive now because so much of the bad debt is concentrated within the financial system. Um, what's the second alternative? If, that, if you accept that, well, the second alternative is to reconstruct the finances of the banks by basically converting bond debt, debt into equity. So the creditors bear the penalty. Lots of economists believe that's a sensible thing to do. It's just the creditors uh, didn't oversee these institutions. Above all, they lent too freely to these institutions. The, the, the reason people are very unhappy about a, a, a mass debt to equity swap of this kind in the banking system is that bank bonds are a very important part of the universe of investment grade bonds in this country. They're about a quarter of all the investment grade bonds in this country, and they are worldwide very important. So if the Americans did this, everybody would have to do it. And the worry is that you would spread a new panic, which would affect not only the banking industry, uh, but the bond markets, the insurance companies, the pension funds. Mm. And the, the, the view would be, well, the economy just isn't strong enough to stand that. But it is the liquidationist principle. You basically would have to do a debt for equity swap. And you'd have to do it ruthlessly and quickly. And you'd have to accept there are risks. It could be m multiple Lehmans. And if you rule those two out, then you're in, you end up with temporary nationalization. And that's just simply a matter of logic. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it, Let's, let's talk a minute, going back to the first part of our discussion about the unique role the U.S. has, because as it bungles and then finds its way and then acts, basically, because we are the most powerful country in the world economically, because we are the reserve currency, the, 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 our sins are spread and our mistakes are spread globally. And, and that's what makes us, I guess you would say, a unique debtor country. Well, you are a unique debtor country, certainly because you're the only country that's ever been able to borrow freely on this scale. Well, the, the British had this position a long ago, but actually in, when Britain was still an economic hegemon, hegemon, hegemonic power in the uh, um, 19th century, it was actually a creditor, vast creditor, not a debtor. Uh, at its peak, three times GDP was its net asset. So the U U.S. position now is quite unique in this regard. Uh, so far, it's been able to borrow freely, and no one could ever guarantee that this will go on forever. It, one could imagine a situation in which people around the world said, oh, is my money really safe in the U.S., given what's going on? I mean, you could imagine people, and lots of people are saying, is there going to be big inflation in the U.S.? Uh, are they going to wipe out the value of my dollar debt, uh, you know, what I'm holding? That is a risk. But so far, uh, the U.S. has remained immune from this. Uh, Long-term interest rates, though they've backed up a little recently, are still very low. The dollar has been uh, very robust in this crisis. It's a very privileged position. The, the, the broader point you may, I would make however, in two further ways. Ever since at least the First World War, the US has been the dominant economy in the world. It's been the largest economy in the world, in fact, since the la latter part of the 19th century, probably about 1880, I would guess, is when it became the largest economy in the world. Ever since the 1920s, it's been the, the, clearly the dominant actor. And all the major crises in the world, the, the Great Depression, the great inflation of the 70s, this crisis now, start with the US. You know, one of the things the US has given the world is very big economic crisis. Mm -hmm. And now, they've started here, but when, when the, you know, one of, we've been reminded again in this crisis, I say this often, is that the US is the, the center of the world economy. And if the US has a very serious crisis, it will become a global crisis automatically, because the U.S. financial markets are the center. U.S. Uh, financial markets will then respond to this crisis, as they, for example, have done now by pulling money out of emerging economies because, they, they're because of the flight to safety by investors pulling money out of hedge funds, for example. So money comes out from the world. This affects everybody in the world. So the U.S. 
is the source, uh, has been the source of the major crises of the world economy in the last uh, 90 years. Um, and then, of course, the US is always the principal voice in any uh, organized system for resolving the crisis in any reforms of regulation. For example, we could not reform the world system of financial regulation without U.S. approval, in not immediate approval, without U.S. action. You can't regulate the world financial markets without the U.S. being part of that. Similarly, we couldn't reconstruct the International Monetary Fund to be a more effective institution if the U.S. didn't take leadership. We won't rebalance the world economy in the way I would like to see it happen without U.S. leadership. So the U.S. has consistently been, over the last century or so, both the source of some very severe economic problems and the source of the solution. Uh, well, it's created some problems now, so now I'd like to seize the solution. And, and in, in this down the road, when these reforms might come, uh, uh, it's really going to be about the U.S. Uh, leading, but in the context of a recognition of the reduction of its hegemonic power. Is that correct? I think that is probably correct. I think the I was thinking about the comparison with the 30s, which is an interesting comparison. I mean, the 30s was an unbelievable mess in every possible way. But the US then was essentially self-sufficient in all raw materials and resources. Its trade was a very small part of GDP. It, it owned already the world's most valuable currency. It was a very large, it was in fact the dominant creditor nation of the world, had been ever since the First World War. So basically all the cards were in America's hands. There was really nothing the rest of the world could do to the US, and there was an enormous amount the US could do to the rest of the world. So there was an immense imbalance of power in that sense. And of course, again, that showed itself in the uh, Second World War. Um, as people have been pointing out, the US got into and fought and won the world, the, this mighty world war in, I think, rather less than half the time you spent in Iraq. So it is a revealing of the immense power that the US had at that stage in its history. Uh, its apogee really was the middle of the 20th century in, in that sense. Now, things have changed since then. The US is uh, certainly a smaller part of the world economy now than it was then. It's, it's dependent on foreign capital inflows. It runs very large deficits. Uh, it, there are even, to some degree, competitors for the role of the dollar. The euro is at least a bit of a, a competitor. China is a rapidly rising great power uh, with an enormous population and huge potential. So while I would stress the US remains without a doubt the strongest single actor in the world, it has a range of assets, economic and elsewhere, and, uh, and in other areas, which is unique. But its ability simply to say, this is what I want to happen, and it's going to happen, is as surely events of the last decade, both in, in foreign policy and economics, have shown that that capacity is limited. On the other hand, this is the final word, um, the world, I think, really does want American leadership. Mm -hmm. There isn't another leader. There is uh, uh, still, though it's of course reduced, a great deal of quite admiration and trust around the world for much that America stands for and a, and a hope that it will provide leadership to save a system which you have to remember it created, it promoted. The open international economy of today is essentially an American ideal, idea. Um, so I think, yes, the, the world wants uh, leadership from the United States and it's quite likely to respond. Mm -hmm. one, one final question requiring a brief answer, if possible. How do you think capitalism, when we come out of this, will be changed by all that has happened? This is a really the biggest question of all. Just make two cons. First, I don't think, but I could be proved wrong, that uh, it, it is confronting a fundamental ideological competitor, as it did in the middle of the 20th century with, with socialism or communism. Uh, so it will remain the dominant ideology in the terms of how you run an economy broadly defined. But I'm sure that however, it, however uh, we emerge, how mess however messily we emerge, that the role of government is bound to be much enhanced. 
The people who think that the outcome of this will be a move towards the minimal state, because this has shown that even this degree of state interference doesn't work, are, are not going to win this argument. The worldwide, the conclusion from this will be we need stronger governments to protect us from wilder markets. Uh, I think we can live with that. Uh, but I suspect the governments will be more powerful and that could have good sides to it and bad side. And the bad side will be lots of protection, lots of friction, lots of politicization of the economy. You know, it's like all these things, there are good sides and bad sides. Martin, on that note, I want to thank you for being here. I want to show your book again, which I think is a, is a very important uh, for understanding the present crisis. Uh, uh, and its multiple causes. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's a great pleasure. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.